I don't want to tell them what I'm doing in case I blow it up. I want it to still be under warranty. To set the stage for the Cannonball in 79, you have to go back to 71 when Brock and Dan Gurney ran into Daytona. And there was a, an article in Sports Illustrated about it. So I'm over at my neighbor's house with my, one of my friends, and, you know, he got Sports Illustrated. I wasn't that into sports, so, you know, he goes, hey, you got to see this, because the two of us were always talking about how cool Baja was and the fact that these guys were doing it, and maybe one day we could, you know, do something like that. And I had got my license, and I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, we could always plan for this, but we're still in high school. What do we know? We're both looking at the article and reading it, and it gets to the point where, you know, Dan has his famous quote, at no point did we ever exceed 175 miles an hour. And it had a great picture of them, you know, with the speedometer and he's holding on with two fingers and he's like 170 plus. And it's going like, this is so cool. You know, I hadn't even really been keeping up with car and driver at that time or anything. So I didn't really know about it. It's the first I'd heard. This is something I would kill to do. You know, I have got to try to do this if the opportunity ever comes up. Finally, in 78, I started thinking, well, you know, maybe they'll run it soon. And I saw, you know, I loved Lotus's Old Time Avengers, the TV series thing. And I saw that there was an Esprit for sale in Northern Jersey. And I think it was like $17,000, which was a boatload of money. And I talked to my brother who happened to be up from the army and he was looking for a new car. He had a, a 260Z and we decided we would see if we can get it. So I sold my cars, he sold his car. He took out a, I think the maximum finance he could get on it was maybe $10,000. I took out a personal loan for $4,000. And together we pooled our money with the understanding that if they had the cannonball, I would get to run the car. But meanwhile, it was his car to use down in Georgia. So it was, you know, it was a cool thing. And then I had subscribed to Brock's newsletter. Suddenly he wrote down, let's do it. And I was like, what? And I remember I was down in Savannah when I, you know, first read it. And I said, Bill, they're doing it. I, I got to apply, you know, can I use the car? And he goes, yeah. I sent one, you know, sent a thing in a letter and he sent me the application. I filled it out and it was pretty simple. But he wanted to know any racing experience, which I had had two years of Formula Ford racing at that time between California and Canada. In the Jim Russell School, I had my Canadian national license and... The guy who was going to be my partner was Dick Dodge Jr., who had just won Pikes Peak Hill Climb that year. He had just beaten Bobby Unser's 11-year-old record by like three quarters of a second. So I sent in the application, and it comes back and it says, congratulations, you've been accepted, you know, and expect to travel on these dates. We want to keep it as quiet as possible, so don't, you know, tell anybody about it if you can. Can't expect to transport a tux unwrinkled across country, so don't worry about that. And just generally, you know, be aware of, you know, Ohio. Two weeks later, they gave us the date and the time to be there at the Lock, Stock and Barrel. I'm just going like, well, okay, that's not the red ball, but all right, why not? I go down about two or three days before the start of the cannonball, which is not a lot of time, with my friend. And we fly down to Savannah, pick up the car and drive it back. Tested it out on the way. And like my friend took it up for the 100 and it's like the first time he'd ever gone that fast. And I'm like, yeah, go man, go. And he was like so impressed. So then we get back home and I look and it's like, these tires in the rear are looking kind of eh, half slick on the inside. And apparently my brother who doesn't have much mechanical sympathy never bothered to notice. And it's the first time we'd ever heard of a four wheel alignment on a car. Well, apparently the dealer never did it either. And then we picked it up. All right, I want to get it checked out at the dealership in Jersey. And I don't want to tell them what I'm doing in case I blow it up. I want it to still be under warranty. I'm going in and I'm being kind of cagey and it's like Saturday morning and the event starts Saturday night. Uh, I can't do this in these tires. I said, we're going to LA. And he goes, well, if you take it easy, you know, these will make it, it'll be fine. I'm going like, no, I mean, you know, I'm not so sure they're going to make it. And he had six other Esprits sitting there. And I'm going, could you just like take the tires off of this one in the rim and just swap them and I'll pay you for them, you know, anything. And he goes, no, no, no. So I show up and, you know, there's no way I was going to find any tires at that late stage. So I'm like, all right, and then, you know, guys in the parking lot start noticing. And I was worried about, you know, Brock was going to say something or whatever, but he didn't. Brock had basically done a Noah's Ark list on the 
Cannonball, he had two Lotus Esprits, two 308 Ferraris, two Porsche Turbos, two, you know, boom, 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 as much as he could do. One of the things that really surprised us when we got to the shopping center, because we were all pulled around the back to keep it hidden, was there was a ton of cars. And I didn't know how many until a couple hours later, but there were like 45 cars registered. I'm like, man, that's a bunch. Because before, I think the most they'd ever had was maybe a dozen. And it become this huge underground cult thing. And everybody was just in there. And I remember the driver's meeting, just looking around. And Brock was standing on top of the dumpster with George Lyle, who owned the lock, stock, and barrel, addressing the crowd. And there's like a sea of humanity. I'm going like, are all these people involved in this? This is amazing. And well, most of them were. I think everybody did it just because of the opportunity. Whether or not it continued again, nobody even thought about it. It was just kind of like, let's do it while we can. And we had our starting orders, and I think I was like the tenth one to take off. So I was pretty early in the pack, and it was drizzling slightly. We get off, and I miss Dennis Mendocini's take off in the truck up the hill, which I do remember him down there getting things, looking things over and wondering what he was up to. Going along, and it's Saturday night traffic, on 95, going from Connecticut through New York City to the George Washington Bridge. And surprisingly, it wasn't too bad. I caught up to the Ferrari 308 in front of us, and he took off to go across the Tappan Zee to avoid the city traffic. And we make it into the George Washington Bridge, and I look at my partner, and I said, if you want to bail, now is the time to do it. He goes, no, 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 let's, let's do this. We're going through Pennsylvania, and the long climb up the hill, it was foggy from Stroudsburg to Pocono, and the car was kind of like, struggling a little. I'm going like, okay, keep an eye on the gauges. I don't want to blow it up so quick. And so we finally plateau and the car starts running really good. And now it's about 11 something at night. And we're out near Dubois, PA, which is about 310 miles into Pennsylvania. And I'm going like, well, I still got gas. It'll be fine. You know, the gas gauge is reading okay. And I get about a mile past the exit and it starts going. And I'm going like, oh no, I'm out of gas. Back in the old days, you didn't have cell phones. You know, you didn't have anybody to come bail you out. You had to get out and walk. And I made it back to this gas station about a mile behind, and the guy was getting ready to close up, the kid. I said, look, I need just a small can. He says, I'll give you 20 bucks deposit for the can. Just give me a gallon of gasoline, and I'll come right back, and I'll give you your can, and I can fill up. And he goes like, hmm, all right. And somebody gave me a ride back up to the car. Dump the gas in the car, find a place to turn around, come back down, and now it's like midnight, and we fill the car up and take off again. So it's like, well, we lost about 45 minutes doing that. We get further into Pennsylvania, and again, this was the 80s. This was the same weekend as Three Mile Island was melting down. So nobody, you know, in the right minds, and me included, was gonna go near Harrisburg. Running across an 80 was just torn up really bad. And there was this one bridge, you come down a hill and you make a right-hand turn at the base of the hill, and there's this really long bridge. You know it's really high because it's so long. Before you hit the bridge, the cement had sagged a little. So we're coming down at about 100, 110, and my partner's driving at this point, and we hit it, and the front end lifts up and stays up. And I'm going like, keep it straight, keep it straight. And I'm like leaning forward, doing whatever I can to try to get the car to settle down. And he just held it steady and it came down. It was like straight as hell. It was like, thank God. <laughs> you know? So we dodged that bullet. Get to Ohio. There's a car off to the side, right on the border, like a Chrysler. And on the CB, he starts coming, hey, Blue Lotus and Blue Lotus. And you know, the third time I finally answered, I'm going like, yeah. He goes, are you number three? I said, number three and what? He goes, Cannonball. I'm going, what's that? It's like, okay, we know we're the third one through here. And the guy in the Ferrari who had taken off ahead of us, we get, and this is with my 45 minutes of downtime, we get into Akron and he's right in front of us again. Later on, I was talking to him in LA and I says, what the hell happened? He goes, he got stopped three times in the span of five miles in Akron. The last time they hit him for 56 miles an hour. And as he's rolling the window down, the cop says, you in a hurry, Mark? So it was like, okay, they knew we were coming and it was Ohio. You know, another interesting phenomenon is my entire life of driving, which is, you know, racing, cannonball, 4-1 laps of America, everything. I have never gotten a speeding ticket. And I'm just like super paranoid. So, <laughs> you know, and now I'm driving an old piece of crap Toyota, so it doesn't go that fast anyway. And it's invisible because it's a Corolla. <laughs> so 
it worked fine. And we were like cruising through Indianapolis. We were making good time. We were about 100 miles east of St. Louis in this little town called Effingham. And we'd gone about close to 1,100 miles at that point in 11 and a half hours or so, maybe 12 hours. And it's like, yeah, okay, this is still, we're still doing good. And we hit a puddle as we're going around a turn with these interstate splits and the car just snapped. And I had just fallen asleep for the first time in like 40 hours. And I wake up and I see the guardrail coming at me sideways. And I'm like, oh, shit. so I lean forward and I put my hand on my head and it smacks the, you know, the side window on the impact and it spun around and he caught it as it bounced off and straightened it out. And he goes, we lost a tire. And I'm like, all right, well, we pulled over and I looked under the car, just opened the door and put my head down. It's like, no, they're all up. So he fires it up and we get about a half mile down the road and the thing cuts out again. And it wouldn't start up and we're going like, oh crap, I'm really screwed something up, what's going on? And the steering rack was bent out because he had the wheel. And my partner was a last minute replacement for the original guy who was, and this guy was like six foot four, which in a Lotus Esprit is not a good combination. And when the car lost it, he went to catch it and his hand hit his leg. So he couldn't get full lock on it. And it hit and then he opened his legs up and was able to catch it on the rebound. It was too late at that point. And then it was his turn to go get a tow truck because I did the first one. And it was raining and it was miserable. And about an hour later, Wrecker shows up. Meanwhile, Brock goes by in the ambulance and he could smell something wasn't quite right there. <laughs> the guy takes us back and we're in this little town with nothing to do. It's, it's a Sunday. And we waited five hours in the bus stop for a ride to St. Louis. We got into St. Louis, I said, you know, I'm checking into a nice hotel. We got into the Marriott. I made reservations to go fly out to LA because my brother was flying out with his friend to pick the car up to take it back after the race. And uh, my other partner's like, no, I'm going back to Boston. So it's like, all right, fine. So I went, that was the end of the cannonball for me. And I went out to LA and proceeded to have a great week with the guys. It was insane. And a lot of it came down to luck of the draw, the time you left, the time you got there. Because when you got 45 cars running, the guys at the back, the cops are wise. Yeah. So they're going to get most of the heat when in their front, it's easier to slide under it. So apparently, like I said, we were the third one into Ohio on Interstate 80 at the time, even with our screw up. So yeah, you know, again, it's all just a bunch of luck, but it was fun. And that's what it was all about, a sense of adventure, fun, maybe a little rebelliousness. Vinwicky wants to thank Auto Tempest for supporting our channel and making it easy for our viewers to find their dream cars. We love Auto Tempest because it allows you to compare the results from Craigslist nationally with all the top listing sites. So visit autotempest.com today and find your next dream car.